Thank you for joining me for this important discussion on Budget 2023. I'm your host, Shaquan Gill, and for this particular discussion, I have with me the Minister of Parliamentary Affairs and Governance, the Honourable Go the Honourable Gail Tashira. Minister Tashira, thank you so much for thank joining me. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Minister, let's get uh, straight into the business of today. Um, what has the government been able to do, particularly under your purview of parliamentary affairs, um, in the form of legislation? to transform the country? Well, the, the legislative agenda is actually very heavy and we've uh, accomplished about uh, 57 bills in the last, from October 2020 to now. Mm -hmm. That includes budget uh, bills and things like that, appropriation bills. But I think that the, the, the breadth of the bills that we brought are related to what will make life easier for people, what will make business and be able to function better mm -hmm. and so and in fact as you know we haven't brought new taxes right. which is always a bill mm -hmm. in themselves uh, so that um, that's legislation so the the kind of bills we brought to do with higher purchase and um, birth registration amendments to make it easier for people to be registered at birth and or death particularly in the interior areas inheritance for persons uh, for the changing the law so that a woman who's a wife or a common-law wife can inherit directly from the person who dies, the yeah. male who dies. Mm -hmm. um, the amendment in the civil union laws to allow for, again, inheritance and so forth. The changes in the bills to do with um, powers of attorney, for example, bail, uh, these are areas which change and improve the way the judicial system functions right, and, right. and to have greater transparency, particularly with how the bill we brought to do with our not notary publics, for example. And so that's in the judicial area, the whole area of uh, juvenile, uh, what you call restorative justice, for example. Uh, the amendments to, uh, to, that we brought based on the CCJ ruling to do with cross-dressing. Mm -hmm. So we're in compliance with the Caribbean Court of Justice ruling. Many countries have rulings from the court and take a long time to implement them. In fact, the issue on cross-dressing was completed by the CCJ some time around 2018. Mm -hmm. But we brought it uh, to the House. So you have those combination of bills that will make life easier for people, accessing services. Others have to do with, as I said, improving the judicial system, improving the way, making it more efficient, removing ambiguities, including in terms of the security sector. Then you have the areas that relate to, uh, for example, the... Um, when we liberalize the telecommunications sector. So the bill had passed in the past, uh, the previous government, but was, was never, no, there was no commencement order mm. until we came in. And that has now begun to open up the whole telecommunications sector and the whole thrust of trying to make it cheaper, more affordable mm -hmm. for people, people have choices. And uh, then you have a whole slew of other bills that have to do with uh, the condominium bill, for example, that opens up a whole new area of investment, putting in uh, structures. And you have other areas to do with um, mental health, for example, mm -hmm. the health areas and mental health, the radiation bill that's in a spe special select committee, the evidence bill that's in a special select committee. These are a new the human transplant. You know, everyone's... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, right. You know, who would think that, you know, we would be talking about that or even setting up a mechanism mm -hmm. to deal with that. And so these are all, it's a broad scope of interventions that are innovative, correcting what may be wrong, amending what needs to be upgraded and modernized, as well as new interventions, new innovative um, legislation, including, as you know, the electoral bills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The two new bill, the bills that were brought, the electoral, um, the the ROPA mm -hmm. and the registration bill were both passed and acted. Um, that again, try to make sure that what happened in 2020 never happens again. Mm -hmm. And so what we thought were the legislative uh, framework we had was a good one. 2020 kind of threw that out the window and one had to go back and look at where were the ambiguities, where were the lacunas in the legislation to ensure that persons who had, um, you know, dastardly objectives to take away the will of the people mm -hmm. to vote for who they wanted, that should not happen again. And so 
it's it's a very interesting legislative uh, agenda. We have many other things to come. Uh, the combating of trafficking in persons, that's a, a new bill to replace the old one. We are looking at uh, family violence, domestic violence, amendments to a number of other legislation, including sexual offenses, etc. Then you have the other laws that are uh, e-commerce transactions, which is an important one yeah. that we need in our country. We have on the agenda the single window uh, facility. So the number, again, this, this, this broad... Uh, approach to try to rectify and to remedy and to innovate mm -hmm. and you know and so I think that that is what makes our legislative agenda really interesting. Yeah. Minister, under your purview as well sits um, commissions like the Ethnic Relations Commission, yes. the Indigenous Peoples Commission. Yeah, all the constitutional All the constitutional commissions. Well, well I'm, I'm not in charge of it because these are independent bodies. No, right, right, of course. Of but course. in terms of piloting their, their budgets, making sure that they're able to function properly and uh, to look at where their weaknesses are and how to strengthen them according to the constitutional amendment and hopefully uh, that they will uh, support some of the interventions I'm proposing, that is to have the support of the UN, for example, to look at how do we strengthen the way the, the commissions are organized, yeah. how they they have to have uh, standard protocols to do with how you deal with a complaint. So there's no subjectivity. Right. If you make a complaint about race or I make a complaint about race, that we're treated differently or you might not understand that there's a standard mm -hmm. uh, protocol. Yeah. So those commissions, um, we have Ethnic Relations Commission and Women and Gender. We've completed the first phase, which was the list of entities that requires two thirds. Then we have now the second phase is completed. That is the nominees from the civil society. Mm -hmm. That has just the committee met on Wednesday and approved it. So that should go into Parliament and go on the audit paper while we're in budget. And as soon as we finish budget, we should debate that and get that over. And that's a simple majority. Yeah. The rights of the child one is sitting on the agenda and waiting. And it could have been concluded since November, December. That's um, the list of entities yeah. to be consulted. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, it, it, it's a two-thirds. You require 43 votes. Mm -hmm. And each time the opposition evaporated, Not they didn't walk out, they just evaporated by the time you came to that and you had like, you couldn't make the 43. Right. And I could not risk putting that on the table because once it's defeated without the two thirds, I can't bring it back until after 2025. Mm. So that's why we said, okay, let's hope and wait and get that through. IPC also, so my uh, agenda is to try to ensure that the four rights commissions are all appointed no later than the middle of this year. That's my objective, and I think two should be, once everything goes well in Parliament, that we should be able to do that and and say to the President, can you please appoint, yeah. uh, hopefully by the end of February. Yeah, definitely. So we know that those commissions are extremely, extremely important. Absolutely, to that, absolutely. No? Particularly the Ethnic Relations Commission. Yeah, they're yeah. all very important, but, but, but the Ethnic Relations Committee has a special role to play mm -hmm. because the way it came about in the Constitutional Reform Commission was to provide a, a remedy for people who felt that they had grievances, particularly to do with ethnic discrimination, racial discrimination. And so its mandate is very clear in the Constitution. And so we need to make sure it is it has the resources to function, has the right mm -hmm. qualified people in the system there who know what to do and to uh, operate in a very independent, professional right. manner and treat the public well, and to be able to take the complaints investigate them, examine them, and be able to make decisions, mm -hmm. you know, on whether it, it is true and therefore what happens after that. You right. go to the police, you go under the Racial Hostility Act, you go on a constitutional uh, case, etc. So I'm looking forward to that body getting reestablished because since April 2021 it has not been. Mm -hmm. But we know that there was great dissatisfaction with it yeah. prior to that. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that... You see, Shaquan, confidence building in democracies have to do about making sure institutions work right. and they work efficiently and effectively. Mm -hmm. So people have to trust. Yeah. And so making sure the constitutional bodies are operating, that first of all, they're not uh, what you call um, uh, being, being kept back from doing the work because they don't have resources. So none of their budgets that they put forward in 
2020, 21, 22, and now this one have been cut as what happened prior mm -hmm. um, to 2018. So that they are assured that the money they want, they get. And, and that's an important part of their work, to know that their their resources are what they've asked for. For the public is to be have confidence mm -hmm. that I've made a report, I've had a hearing, people have listened to me, and then explain maybe why my case is not justified or that I'm in the wrong place or that to give me satisfaction of having a process go through. That is a critical element of democracy because not everyone can go to the court. Right. But this this redress this and remedy is an important uh, concept in our constitution. It's a fundamental concept of democracy for us. Yeah. And so ethnic relations plays that very, very critical role of, of in, people feeling, regardless of what ethnicity they are, that they can bring their case forward and they'll have a fair hearing. Right. Fair hearing. That's what people want. Yeah. And this is, we discuss uh, fairness, justice, all of these things under uh, governance. There has there have been some claims yes. um, that there is, uh, or the budget and the allocations within the budget are going towards, and I'll quote it, friends, family, and favorites of the current government. How does your government respond to something like that? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm flabbergasted that they would even say that because it is so absurd and so against what is in the budget documents. Clearly, either they weren't listening carefully to the budget speech or they just, as usual, knee-jerk. But let, let's look at that dispassionately. If you look at the budgets of the regions, the region budget budgets have been increasing astronomically from 2020 to now. So there's no disparity between a region that AP and UFC won versus a region that we won. Mm -hmm. There's no disparity. It's based on population, size, etc. When you look at the allocation of resources, housing, water, infrastructure, the education, health. Can anyone say that in education, the allocation of school buildings is discriminatory, that this is friends and family? Are you saying that, um, for example, in the housing program, who's going to benefit from this? You know, it is the people that's going to benefit. This is a pro-people budget. Our government has always taken the position of pro-poor, pro-growth. And in this phase, too, it is pro-poor, pro the persons who need the resources. So while you have the old age, you have the public assistance, you have the programs that to do with helping people um, maintain their houses with the cement and the... and the. No one's saying, well, which, which group of people is getting this? So they need to be asked, actually, what do you mean by that? Because if I'm going to say it's friends and family and crony... Who am I talking about? Oh, this is just catchphrases that they're populist, they're emotional, and get people just repeating like parrots. Mm. Because that, that's how they treat people in this country, as if they're parrots. So you just like, give a sexy phrase, and then people repeat it. Where are the cronies in the families? Um, the budget, and, and to answer that issue, too, from another angle, Shaquan, we have a very good anti-corruption framework in this country. So let's assume the opposition's right. This is all about giving our people mm -hmm. work, our friends, families, and party supporters work. I mean, they're saying it out of their own guilty complex because that's what they did. But let's put that aside and assume they're right, just for the argument's sake. When we go to tender, we have to go to tender whether it is selective, single uh, source, whether it's public tender, the law devises that. The cabinet's role is limited in terms of the, the threshold, which we look at. And we don't have the right to change a tender. We have to say no objection or we withhold objection. Uh, we, we, we are objecting because of the following reasons. We can't just object because we don't like you, the contractor. We have to be able to say, look, there's something wrong with this thing. And then it goes back to the tender board, and the tender board says, yeah, we checked, and everything's fine. We have no object. We have no alternative than to offer the no objection. 
So those are built-in mechanisms by law. The Constitution has a public procurement commission. I'm talking about constitutional bodies. That's the other one that's set up and yeah. functioning. Mm -hmm. So that's a new commission that's come in, headed by a woman. I'm very proud of that. Of course, I always like to see my women in position. Of course. <laughs> Guyanese women. <laughs> yeah. um, but the... And then we have the Auditor General's Office, and we have the Public Accounts Committee. And you have, I think, participated or observed some of the rigors of the Public Accounts Committee. Some of the arguments we get carried away, but, but the Auditor General's report. Unlike pre-'92, where when we came into government, for 10 years there was no audit of this country, had never come to the Parliament, never gone to PAC. Hmm. And we had to write off, eventually, those 10 years of... Billions and billions had to be written off by our government in, in the 90s. And so the when they talk about it, as I said, I think it is just that the opposition knows that their behavior in government and their behavior has been one about nepotism, about cronyism, about... And one of the ministers has said, I need a doctor, I need a Spanish-speaking doctor, but she must be PNC. I mean, that's been the practice. Mm. That's that's how the PNC has been in government under Burnham times, right through, and then 92, they were no longer in government. And then they get their chance to show that they reformed. They win the 2015 election, and they basically squander those five years by the same old bad habits, undemocratic, dictatorial, you know, and, and corrupt. And so now they look at, you know, it's like looking in the mirror and seeing yourself, but you're saying that's you, you know, and, and that's what they're doing all the time. So there's nothing there. If, for example, you're a minister and you have a relative that is bidding, what's that got to do with you? Doesn't that contractor or businessman have a right to survive? Once he's doing it correctly, once he's doing lawfully, People have a right to work. They have a right to live. You know, so you can't say, well, all of a sudden now, Gail Teixeira's daughters or sons must not get a job in Guyana. So what, what? Does that make sense? Once they go through an interview and if they're qualified, let them get the job. Once it is the process, the transparency and accountability, the process is what's important. Not who gets the job, you know. And then, of course, they, they look at things from a very... Um, Tainted, you know, they say when you look through your glass, uh, what do you call rose-tinted glasses, mm -hmm. their glasses are tinted with race. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you specifically about that too, Minister. Yeah. How, how can you assure the people of Guyana that, that the finances that will be flowing from this yeah. budget will go to the common man and, and that happens irrespective of race, religion, political persuasion or anything like that? Action speaks louder than words. And so... This government, particularly President Ali, has been phenomenal in turning up at places at four in the morning at Fisherman's Wharf, of going into communities and, and been welcomed by every community, whether they voted for the APNU in the past elections. People want to see development. People want to see their issues addressed. When it comes to election time, they'll go and vote for who they want to. At this point, they want to see progress. And so that whole approach of being visible, this cabinet is extraordinarily visible and accessible. The president is very action-oriented. And so it's not like what we had before, where the former president, you hardly saw him. You had a barricade around him of 20 feet that you couldn't shake his hand, you couldn't touch him. You had ministers who never went into Upper Mazaroni for the whole year, all the years they were ministers until election time. That's not our behavior. That's not our tradition as a party. But it's escalated even more now. So that, first of all, is first being hurt. What are the issues you want? Because clearly, in some cases, governments sit in their offices and say, oh, yeah, that community needs that and that community needs that. Sometimes they don't want that. They want something else. And so, one, accessibility, visibility, communi communication with the people, involving the people, having them come out and say, look, these are the problems, Mr. President or Minister. You know, gt and is a problem, or the Internet's a problem, or the road's a problem, or whatever. And the second issue is then responding to that. Mm -hmm. 
what can we fix, what can't we fix. And so in the budget, the things that have come out here emerge from community meetings about the bridges and the roads, the whole infrastructure program at the community development level. So that whole thrust of local government and public works to do with community development, improving the quality of life of people in the communities in terms of when children have to walk to school. You had recently with Minister Rodriguez, with Sophia, right. two very bad uh, areas where children had to go through. We have other areas like now, other parts of the country we need to fix as well. So children walking to school are walking to school in safe areas and areas where they can't injure themselves and things like that. And so that responsiveness, that wasn't in the budget. It wasn't in the budget. But you have a need and you try, you find and you cut and you paste and you look, how can your budget respond to that with the, and keeping within the law? So that's one issue, the, the, the communication, the accessibility and to be able to have their views heard. The second thing, of course, is implementation. How do we implement? And so it's important that the regional democratic councils function, the neighbor democratic councils function, because they're all part of the apparatus to implement. And there are weaknesses in those two areas, obviously. So the ministers and ministries take on a lot of that thrust and work to make sure that the commitments we made are maintained. The distribution when we came in of the COVID-19 relief and then the hinterland and riverine relief. People make loose comments about that, but every team that went out, every single household and community had auditors with them. So auditors went all up in Chinooing, all down the savannas. You know, some of the guys had never been out of Georgetown. They got a good immersion in Guyanese geography. But every single distribution has been audited. The same thing with the uh, Child uh, We Care program. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the uh, Disabled Children's uh, Grant. They've all been had the presence, not audited after, audited at the time as we go through. There's an auditor there. And so that's have transparency to make sure that people... There are going to be sometimes people who are left out, they were skipped, they weren't at home, whatever it was. We can rectify those, but someone has to represent them, or they have to represent themselves. Those who have done that in the main have been taken care of. The housing programs. When we took over 68,000 applications sitting waiting, thanks to the former ministers of housing, who did nothing, basically. And so when we look at the housing program, Shaquan, one about making sure it's been the thrust of the PP government since 1994 when we started the national housing program. What was the objective? Safe and clean shelter. Newer and safer communities. And it was all about trying to make sure people had running water, their basic housing. As it grew, it gave collateral to people. Mm -hmm. So someone who owns a house or has land, they can go to the bank and borrow. And so this new facility brought in by increasing the loan uh, portfolio to 20 million for low income allows you now to get a low uh, interest rate. Even prior to that, pre-2015, when the government negotiated with the commercial banks, that once you got a low-income house and you had the guarantee from the uh, central housing and planning, you went to the bank and got your loan 5% or whatever it was at that time. So that the housing program is a, what you call a microcosm in a way of how an investment in housing and by provision of subsidized housing in this country, land is subsidized by the government. It has led to new communities, cleaner communities, safer communities. It has led to the breakdown of the 1960s, post-1960s violence of Indian black, Indian black villages on East Coast, East Bank. It has led to new communities, which now as uh, Tushan, uh, sorry, um, Diamond, hospital, uh, uh, banks, fast food places, police station, fire station, schools, health centers. This is an investment that government and people did together. 
because people pay for their land, they pay for the house. So the housing program, and, and in terms of women, 46%, uh, according to Minister Susan Rodriguez, 46% of the applicants and people who have received housing are female. That's extraordinarily high in the whole of this hemisphere. Extraordinarily high. We're flying in that. And so, and for women who have been victims of, of violence or husbands who men just make sure and walk away, mm -hmm. um, this is empowering. They now have power, they have collateral, they own, they have tenure. They can go to the bank and if any man there with behaves bad, they can throw him out. You know, they're, they're, and the gender gap report reflects that. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So this is the the story, Shaquan. We can get caught up in the what the opposition says, but the story, the narrative of how where we've come from, where we are, and where we're going, all these things. When you look at the budget about closing the gap between who are poor and those who are more comfortably off, and those who are rich. Trying to close the gap, close the disparities, which are uh, what you call urban, rural, hinterland. Closing the gap between what are geographic differences. Closing the gap in terms of gender. Closing the gap of those who are disabled versus those who are abled. It's a, the number, the interventions in the budget relate to that. It deals with community development. It deals with investments that will lead to job creation. The whole area of goal and the what you call the program called GROW, which mm -hmm. is for those who didn't get uh, high school education, it's about bringing people up and by not just but by giving them opportunities, let them come up. And so, as they, they are able to get better educated, better informed, better skilled, then they're, they're more marketable or they can become small businessmen vendors or whatever, so that trying to make sure that the the poverty gap in terms of uh, unemployment is closed as well, reduced, and that the predictions are that we may not have enough people for the work that has to be done, you know, so that talk to anybody dealing with construction right now. Mm. There aren't enough masons, there aren't enough electricians, plumbers, what you call wire benders, there aren't enough there aren't enough to, and we are going at a terrific speed with roads and bridges and sea defense and stellings and wharfs and et cetera, et cetera, housing schemes. And uh, I remember a visitor came to meet me last week uh, from overseas and they flew in uh, through Ogle and they were mesmerized by the housing scheme that's going up there, the houses going up mm -hmm. and being developed there. Yeah. My my belief is that Guyanese have always wanted to do better. They always want an opportunity, that they're fundamentally ambitious in terms of their goal, of their dreams, where they want to go, where they want their children to go, in the main. And that once they have those opportunities, they will thrive. So this whole thing of the people-centered part of it, the investment in the economy, and in big infrastructure projects. So the Denmark Harbor Bridge, the uh, gas to uh, pipeline, for example, it's two major things that are being dealt with. One, transportation, communication links, time saving. People therefore have more time to study, to have recreation, to spend money elsewhere if they want. And then you have the gas to, to the Wales uh, Energy Authority there that will radically transform the energy sector. And we can, if we don't do that, and there's a lot of naysayers about that project. But if we don't do it, it's going to hold back the manufacturing sector. It's going to hold back a number of the potential investment we have because people need energy. Yeah. And we, the, the consumers in Ghana, would like to have cheaper, right. cheaper energy, of course. And so these are two major interventions that we're doing. Of course, there are all others in, in a range of areas, agriculture in particular. But we're setting the stage. So the last two years, we've been trying to right the country, balance back the country, recover from what happened in the five years, and still look forward all the time. So we're not looking backwards. This is now where you're talking about a jumping-off point. 
that you've done enough laying of the foundation. You've set the train, and this is where legislative changes will come in that will lay the foundation for now moving very, very, uh, in a very structured, organized, and rapid way uh, towards a, a developed country, a developed mm -hmm. nation. And so I think that, um, I think I've told you this before, I tell people at the community meetings, this is our golden age as a country. Yeah. And we can make it or break it. And I think it's a, it's an opportunity for the opposition to get their act together and join. Mm -hmm. When it comes to their politics, do it. Mm -hmm. But don't hold back progress in this country. And don't do what they've done when the president goes to a community that they see that said they won and say, you know, the president needs permission to come in. What utter rot. The president doesn't need permission of anybody. He's the president of the whole country. He can go wherever he wants. He doesn't need permission from anybody to go. And so those attitudinal behavior is what holds people back, yeah. you know? Yeah. Minister, I want to thank you so much for taking the opportunity to have this discussion with me. We've spoken extensively about a number of things that we're hoping to happen in Budget 2023, and we are definitely looking forward to those things. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. This has been another edition of the Budget 2023 Review. I'm your host, Shaquan Gill, saying goodbye for now. Thank <laughs> you.